everyone. Um, I'm Jason, and I am going to talk a whole lot about fonts, but also a bunch of other CSS stuff that kind of ties it together. And I think we'll connect this with some of the other talks that you've been hearing today as well. Um, so all of those things that uh, Yuna talked about are true. Um, the stuff that is probably most relevant for other people is that I walk my dogs a lot. Um, that's probably why most people know me. Uh, you can follow Tristan and Tilly, and they're going to explain variable fonts to you in a little bit. So one of the things that I think is really remarkable about variable fonts is their flexibility and the number of different touch points they have. So I'm going to talk about them a little bit more specifically, but I want to make sure that we keep this in the context of the rest of your working life and explore some of these other things about CSS. So the reason I care about this is because type is the voice of our words. It is the embodiment of the text that is the interface between your application or your website and the user, uh, the reader of that text. And there are different aspects of typography that I really started to think about when I saw this quote from Nina Stosinger. And it really made me think about how I've been so focused on typography for reading, making it easier to consume that text, reducing friction. But there's another aspect of typography that's equally important. Sometimes you need to increase that friction. So we're going to actually look at both sides of this and see how we can make it easier to consume and think less about it, and other times where you want to use it as a way to get somebody's attention. So some foundations, some things that I want to talk about in terms of how we're combining these different qualities. We want to think about things like CSS custom properties and calculations in our CSS and figure out how we can use those in tandem with variable fonts to do some really interesting things. So when we start to introduce the custom properties, we might do really simple things like treat them almost like design tokens where we can change that one thing based on scope and then the heading color will change. But we can also use it with font size and calculation so that we can start to create some systems that allow a little bit of abstraction and then let us change these things based again on placement and layout or usage. So we can start to think about the componentization of our typography in a little bit more flexible way. And then as we start to layer in a few other ways of thinking about this, we start to approach a level of themability. And when we add all of those things in together, it starts to create a little bit of magic. And that's where I think it really starts to get interesting when we start to use all of these things in tandem together. So we can have our little card components that we don't really have to change any of the underlying code, even any other underlying CSS, simply by scoping it so that when we move it in another part of the layout, we redefine one or two of those variables, and it's only relevant when that selector is active. So again, we're rewriting less code, but we're making these components a lot more flexible. And then coming back to variable fonts. So I know there's a few people that raised their hand. I think I was accounted for maybe 20% of them. So I think that was our, our general. There's maybe four other people in the room that were really excited about them. Um, I've been working with them for about three years. And the best description I heard was John Hudson describing it as a single font that acts as many. So instead of having to load or install 30 or 40 or 90 different font files, if you wanted to see an entire family, you can actually see them all together in a single file. And with that, it works on both desktop and in, uh, in, our, in the web. It's been supported in the web for about a year and a half uh, in all the shipping browsers. So it's, uh, the support is actually quite good. Um, and I'll actually talk a little bit. Uh, you can use at supports feature detection in order to scope it so that, of course, Internet Explorer 11 will get the static web fonts. And then we can ship the good stuff to everybody else. So what you see in those little outlines there, these are all um, different CSS applied to the same letter. So it's all one file, but it actually has that whole range of width and weight. So it actually allows you to do quite a bit more. So as an example, um, we've got Tristan on the left and Tilly on the right, and we'll be able to see exactly how the width or the weight, or if you actually have it available in the typeface, you might have X height. And of course, then you have the standard slant. So all of these different axes are there by design. They're not distortions in the browser. They're only what the typeface designer decided to expose 
for that particular typeface, but we can reach them with fairly standard CSS. The fifth element, it's kind of a weird sci-fi joke, but um, I know nobody's even old enough to get it. I'm showing my age again. Uh, so there are five registered axes for variable fonts. There's width, weight, slant, and italic, which are slightly different. Um, and then the fifth one is optical size. Now, optical size is really fascinating because that actually was something that's been done in typeface design and production for over 400 years. And the idea is that when this type is set physically smaller, you want it to be a little sturdier so that it doesn't break apart and become hard to read. So when you look at the text that's on screen here, this is all forced to the same optical size on, on that, along that axis, sort of effectively turning it off. But watch what happens in those top lines when we enable it. And you see, there we go. You see what happens there. I'm going to go back and forward again so you can watch and see how much more delicate the text is in the top. So you get that extended kind of contrast, that really exaggerated thick and thin that gets much finer detail when it's going to be set at a larger size. And that really allows that same typeface to be much more flexible in the way that you use it and the different places where you might apply it. So when you have a width and a weight and an optical size axis, you might not need another typeface in your design. You might just load that one asset and be able to get everything that you need. So that's some really interesting stuff about variable fonts that I've found really compelling. So using all of these things together, um, I started out studying graphic design. So I I'll studied typography a lot, um, got very hung up on whether it was a font or a typeface or if there was um, specific point sizes that I wanted for the type at different uh, size headings and all of that. The reality is I don't actually care anymore. I care about hierarchy, the proportion of this to that. So if we look at the size of the heading on this sort of simulated large screen and then we look at it as it shrinks down, the proportion actually comes down. So the heading is no longer the same multiple on body copy. It might only be two times the body copy size instead of three, but you still know that it's the most important bit on the page. And the kinds of things that are happening here is it's not just the font size, but also the line height, and in some cases even the weight of the text is changing when it goes back and forth between that large and small size. And the reason for that is on a small screen, you want to have smaller text, there's fewer distractions, you don't need to have as big a differentiation between those things. And we can do that actually with a formula like this. So rather than having a whole bunch of breakpoints, we can actually let CSS do the work for us using some custom properties to make it more flexible. Now to put this in prose, what we're telling the CSS to do in this case is when you reach this breakpoint on a small screen, start scaling it with math until you reach this large breakpoint on a larger desktop and stop scaling there. It's a min and max. And this was a technique written about by Tim Brown called CSS locks. And there have been a few other articles recently about different techniques approaching this. The important thing is to remember that we're not using straight viewport units because that's actually a huge accessibility problem and it doesn't give you a min and max. So the problem with, with viewport units, if you don't multiply it by something else, is that you don't get page zoom anymore because your viewport technically isn't changing. So it's important to be able to specify things and for designers to be able to look at it and say, okay, this is roughly what I want the proportion to be on small screen and big ones. Everything else in the middle just takes care of itself. And so to see that more in action, um, in this page that I designed for Monotype last year to uh, sort of showcase their first release in FF Meta, everything on this page has actually been designed with a single file. So the italics, the weight axis, all of that was just this one resource. And then even when you look at that as it resizes, it's not exactly the same, but it's still interesting. And that's okay with me. I mean, I, I think as a designer, I need to let go of some of the things that I can't control and lean into what we can on the web and do something that will give an interesting and meaningful and exciting experience across the board. But that also is another thing that, that typical sort of print design really has to absorb is that we're not really in charge. And I think it was sort of touched upon with a couple of the accessibility 
uh, tidbits earlier where there are things like light modes, things like contrast modes, all of these things are in the hands of the user and if we don't anticipate them, then our design is going to suffer and when somebody forces the issue, it's going to look even worse. So take something like dark mode. That's now part of the OS in all of our devices pretty much um, and we have media queries to support it. So why not start to think about that more intentionally and use our CSS custom properties to create different color palettes so that when somebody switches it over, our website will switch over as well. Now this is cheating. I mean, I just added a class in there, but it does respond just as well to the OS. And one of the other things that I want to add is that it's not just inverting colors. It's creating appropriate color palettes but then also tweaking the typography a little bit. In this case, I'm using the grade axis, which increases the weight of the text without necessarily reflowing it. But I'm also spacing the lettering out just a little bit because when you have bright text on a dark background, those letters tend to bleed together. So it's little subtle changes that we can make this work better rather than a blanket flip to high contrast mode that some users might, might do. And we can also, speaking of contrast, set it up so that we can do the same thing without inverting the colors and we can still subtly increase the foreground, background contrast and the weight of the text. So we can keep it really subtle or we can be a little bit more extreme and we can give somebody access to change the size of the text. And if we're building this into our UI, then we know that our design isn't going to break, everything's going to reflow the way it should, even in the case of something like this that might be a bit more extreme. Now the reason I show this one is because some research that Microsoft talked about at a conference a couple years ago, uh, Kevin Larson from their advanced reading group, was talking about a very small subset of people with dyslexia with a condition known as crowding. And I, I focus in on this because I had a really interesting experience a few weeks ago. I've been talking about this all year and the reason is with that small subset of people, they found that if they could increase word spacing and line spacing, they could increase the reading comprehension for that group of users by 50%. That's massive. And when you can create that big an impact for this group of, uh, of readers of this website by adding two or three lines of code, I mean, why wouldn't you want to do something like that? And so this was all a little bit academic that I would put this stuff in here. But then what, I, uh, what happened at the end of this conference was a young woman came up to me and said, you know, that was really fascinating. I have dyslexia. And as soon as you space those words out, all of a sudden I could read it. And I couldn't read it before. She didn't know that she had that particular condition of crowding. She knew she was dyslexic. But she didn't realize that she could make her own life better simply by altering a user style sheet and use that two lines of CSS to space out the words and the lines. That was really powerful. So I think it really hit home to me that as designers and developers, we have the ability to make things hard or easy. And we need to spend a little bit of time and make them easy. And then figure out ways to make that more reproducible for ourselves. So what I started thinking about was, why don't we just put a little accessibility panel on our websites? and give people that control, use local storage to save the preferences so that it travels with them as they move around the site, it's not really all that hard to do and especially if you use custom properties and that sort of thing to make it a little bit more abstracted, it drops into your UI pretty easily. So I think that's a, an important thing for us to start thinking about. And because I know a lot of us work on many projects, we might work at agencies or companies where your design system gets incorporated into multiple platforms. I wanted to make sure that we could take that same thing and use it in more than one place. So without changing any of the underlying HTML, we could make it look like this and simply add in a few more swaps of those variables so that we could make it a themable system that we could then take from one project to the next. And I've done that in large part bringing this scaling typography and a lot of this stuff from projects over the last two years, including stuff for the state of Georgia back in the US, where there are now over 40 sites in the past year that have been deployed with all of this, with all the variable fonts and all the scaling typography, and it's used by millions of people every day. And all the people in the government that are mandated to use IE11 just get the static web fonts and that's just fine. So it is about that progressive enhancement and giving the largest number of users the best possible experience without ever leaving anybody behind. Now, 
briefly, I want to show you some of the other direction. How can we take our designs and use what variable fonts can do for us to make things even more interesting? So starting out with this really kind of straightforward, it's straight from Medium, New York Times, um, lots of other news websites. It's that sort of big image, single column of text, not really all that. It, it's, it's better than it was before, but it's not really all that interesting. But with a couple extra lines of CSS, maybe we can embrace using columns a little bit or start to separate some things based on the width of the content and then let the images fill the rest using calculations or play around with writing modes. Now this is a case where we want to slow people down. We want them to actually have to work a little bit to read that title because it will make it more memorable. This stuff has been done in print for decades, if not centuries, and it works really effectively. Why not use it on the web? It's all stuff that could actually then reflow and go back to normal, quote unquote, on smaller screens without really any other intervention. But we could get it further. We could use CSS multi-column, an initial letter, uh, a little bit of extra CSS shapes thrown in there that's pretty easy to do. Everything is scaling together or take it even further and let the CSS break up the words. And even that reflows really nicely onto small screens. So all of these things are virtually identical underlying HTML, but if we're working with a content management system and a design system that's built in, why not extend that and not stop with one layout, maybe give people a couple of choices. And these things are all being done with a single variable font file. That's Univer from Monotype that has a width and weight axis and all four of those different options. So I think there's a lot more that we can do and to show this stuff in production, this is probably going to look weird on the next slide, but I'm just going to zoom in anyway. This, is a, a, this new blog has already gone into production on the ad hoc website. We've got a beta version of Proxima Nova as a variable font and then another one called Portata for the text face. If they add one little class and a couple line of, lines of CSS to a blog post, we could get things that... There we go. In the production code, it actually works on all the screen sizes that way, but in our little beta here, it's a little bit off. So it does stuff like this. So when they want to go and have a blog post that has a little bit more art direction, a little bit more power to it, they can add that one design class that will float the title and then they can add a CSS shape down at the bottom of the post and everything works really nicely. And even when it has to reflow onto a smaller screen, they don't lose all of the value of that, that differentiation in the design. So that's another place, uh, just uh, referencing back to the pattern library um, that I designed for the state of Georgia, using all of this same technology, I'm not going to load up the websites here because I'm now officially out of time, um, but uh, that's, it's a pattern lab, it's built into Drupal 8, it's actually powering you know, millions of page views every day, um, and they're deploying more and more sites on it all the time. And one last thing here that I wanted to show you was this creeping more and more out into the wild. What you're seeing here is actually fonts that have been loaded directly from the Google Fonts API. So they are now starting to roll out support for variable fonts. They only have about a dozen of them so far, um, but they're working on adding it to the UI and rolling out even more variable fonts this year. And so we're actually able to use this on a large scale. Um, they've been serving Oswald as a variable font for about six months now, up to 150 million times a day. Um, so they didn't even tell anybody. Nobody had to rewrite any CSS. All they did was replace the at font face declaration and it just works. So it is a pretty remarkable technology. It can do an awful lot. I'm really just scratching the surface with this. But I wanted to show you, you know, this is all in the browser. What you've been seeing today are all real web fonts. They're ones that you can either go and buy or download. And this is a little bit of the cast of characters, if you will. And I just wanted to stress with this that type is how we hear what we read. It's very important that we speak clearly. Thank you very much.